Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers, is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. This is Dorothy Molstead from Waldman House Press in Minneapolis. Christmas 2001 marks the 20th anniversary of a very special book, A Cup of Christmas Tea, written by Tom Haig and illustrated by Warren Hansen. Tom and Warren are here with us today to talk about how they came to write this book and all these other books from Waldman House Press. Hi, I'm Warren Hansen. I'm here in the Barnes & Noble store in downtown Minneapolis overlooking Nicollet Mall with my longtime friend and associate and collaborator, Tom Haig, who uh, called me some 20 years ago now with uh, a poem that he had written called A Cup of Christmas Tea. And neither of us knew at that time that now 20 years later, we'd be sitting here talking to you and talking to each other about the long history of that book and the other books that we've done together. Hello, Tom. Le hello, last thing in the world I would have expected to happen. So it's 20 years ago and I go to a friend of mine, Brian Anderson, who is the publisher of Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine. And I said to him, I've been encouraged to make a book out of a poem that I wrote for my church for their 125th Christmas anniversary. And I said to him, who's the best illustrator in the Twin Cities, bar none? And he said, well, Warren Hanson, and you'll never get him. And he said, here, let me show you a couple of portfolios that he had with him. And he showed me several. And then we got to yours. And instead of it looking like the work of one artist, it's like the work of 20 artists. Because Warren, he'll never tell you this, so I have to, can work in any style at all. So I, I knew he was the guy. So I got his number and I cold called him. And I was at my bumblingly articulate worst because I was uh, so very nervous. We can kind of recreate that for you now. Uh, Hello. Uh, uh, yeah, is, is, this, is this Warren Hansen? Yes. Hi, uh, this is Tom Haig. Uh, you, you don't know me. That's right. But I, I wrote this Christmas poem mm -hmm. for my church. Mm -hmm. And they said that maybe it could be a book. And, mm -hmm. and, and I met this guy who said that you might want to do the pictures for it. He did? Uh-huh. I and, see. And I don't have any money. But, uh, but I got to go. But, but wait a second. Oh. But maybe if, it, maybe if it was good and people bought it, uh, we could make some money then. Um, Could I read it to you? Okay. Okay. And this is what I did. The log was in the fireplace, all spiced and set to burn. At last, the yearly Christmas race was in the clubhouse turn. The cards were in the mail, all the gifts beneath the tree, and 30 days reprieve till Visa could catch up with me. And though smug satisfaction seemed the order of the day, something still was nagging me and would not go away. A week before, I got a letter from my old great aunt. It read, of course, I'll understand completely if you can't, but if you find you have some time, how wonderful if we could have a little chat and share a cup of Christmas tea. She'd had a mild stroke that year, which crippled her left side. Though housebound now, my folks had said it hadn't hurt her pride. They said she'd love to see you. What a nice thing it would be for you to go and maybe have a cup of Christmas tea. But boy, I didn't want to go. Oh, what a bitter pill to see an old relation and how far she'd gone downhill. I remembered her as vigorous, as funny, and as bright. I remembered Christmas Eve's when she regaled us half the night. I didn't want to risk all that. I didn't want the pain. I didn't need to be depressed. I didn't need the strain. And what about my brother? Why not him? She's his aunt, too. I thought I had it justified. But then, before I knew, the reasons not to go I so painstakingly had built were cracking wide and crumbling in an acid rain of guilt. 
I put on boots and gloves and cap, shame stinging every pore, and, armed with squeegee, sand and map, I went out my front door. I drove in from the suburbs to the older part of town. The pastels of the newer homes gave way to gray and brown. I had that disembodied feeling as the car pulled up and stopped beside the wooden house that held the Christmas cup. How I got up to her door, I really couldn't tell. I watched my hand rise up and press the button of the bell. I waited, aided by my nervous rocking to and fro, and just as I was thinking I should turn around and go, I heard the rattle of the china in the hutch against the wall. The triple beat of two feet and a crutch came down the hall, the clicking of the door latch and the sliding of the bolt and a little swollen struggle popped it open with a jolt. She stood there, pale and tiny, looking fragile as an egg. I forced myself from staring at the brace that held her leg, and though her thick bifocals seemed to crack and spread her eyes, their milky and refracted depths lit up with young surprise. Oh, come in, come in. She laughed the words. She took me by the hand, and all my fears dissolved away as if by her command. We went inside, and then, before I knew how to react, before my eyes and ears and nose, was Christmas past. Alive, intact, the scent of candied oranges, of cinnamon and pine, the antique wooden soldiers in their military line, the porcelain nativity I'd always loved so much, the Dresden and the crystal I'd been told I mustn't touch. My spirit fairly bolted like a child out of class and danced among the ornaments of calico and glass. Like magic, I was six again deep in a Christmas spell, steeped in the million memories the boy inside knew well. And here, among old Christmas cards, so lovingly displayed a special place of honor for the ones we kids had made. And there, beside her rocking chair, the center of it all, my great aunt stood and said how nice it was I'd come to call. I sat and rattled on about the weather and the flu. She listened very patiently, then smiled and said, what's new? Thoughts and words began to flow. I started making sense. I lost the phony breeziness I use when I get tense. She was still passionately interested in everything I did. She was positive, encouraging, like when I was a kid. Simple generalities still sent her into fits. She demanded the specifics, the particulars, the bits. We talked about the limitations that she'd had to face. She spoke with utter candor and with humor and good grace. Then, defying the reality of crutch and straightened knee, on wings of hospitality, she flew to brew the tea. I sat alone with feelings that I hadn't felt in years. I looked around at Christmas through a thick, hot blur of tears, and the candles and the holly she'd arranged on every shelf, the impossibly good cookies she still somehow baked herself. But these rich, tactile memories became quite pale and thin when measured by the Christmas my great aunt kept deep within. Her body halved and nearly spent, but my great aunt was whole. I saw a Christmas miracle, the triumph of a soul. The triple beat of two feet and a crutch came down the hall, the rattle of the china in the hutch against the wall. She poured two cups, she smiled, and then she handed one to me, and then we settled back and had a cup of Christmas tea. And then Warren said, I'll do it. <laughs> because Tom had no way of knowing, but just a week or two before that phone call, I had made this very vis visit to uh, my favorite aunt, my Aunt Bernice, who was the only one in the family that had any other artistic ability at all. And she had been um, put into a nursing home for a very short time. And my mom had asked if 
my wife Patty and I would go and visit her. And we didn't really want to go because my mom said she will be crabby. She doesn't want to be there. And <clears throat> but we did make the visit, and I've been glad ever since. And so here's a total stranger on the phone telling me the story of a young man's reluctant visit to his aging relative. And so I had identified with the story right away and recognized it as my own. And so I said yes. And uh, we met at a restaurant. He made me sing uh, <laughs> right there at the table. <coughs> and you sang very well. Oh, thank you very much. Um, he gave me a copy of the manuscript and, and sent me on my way, trusting that I would uh, do justice to his story. And I remember him calling uh, in a few weeks, asking, how's it going? And I said, um, <coughs> fine, <laughs> and when in actuality I hadn't really started. And then I, I got down to business and did the illustrations in their entirety. Called Tom and said, I, I have something for you to see, and invited him over. Now, as I recall, you expected to see maybe some sketches. sketches. maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had given me the tape of your reading of the poem. And so I sat you down at the chair at, at my drawing table, and I had the pile of illustrations sort of orchestrated. So I punched the play button on the tape player so that you could hear your own voice. And I flipped through the illustrations as the text came through the speakers. And um, when the tape ran out, you had tears in your eyes streaming down my face. Now, you probably have been able to guess that Warren, because of the drama of this presentation, also has theater training. And that's my background, mm -hmm. too. Both of us are a couple of hams, and that's <laughs> the way we present things. I couldn't believe it when Warren mm -hmm. put those illustrations out in front of me, because they crystallized perfectly what I'd somehow had in my mind, yet had absolutely no ability through my hands to create. And uh, not, not only that, <laughs> this is a kind of a testament to what I saw in uh, Brian's office, you told me that you'd never worked in this medium right. before. You essentially taught yourself how to work in this medium for this story. Well, I recognized that the story was about this fragile older woman, and it really required the most fragile of media, which is watercolor. And um, of course, I dabbled in watercolor in art school, but really hadn't mastered it very well. Yet I knew that that's what the story required, and so I did. Um, I did make myself uh, at least, at least get uh, good enough at it that I could execute these these illustrations. And uh, apparently, after all these years, I've still fooled people into thinking <laughs> that I can do it. <laughs> now, just a little backstory here. Before I had approached Warren, I had been encouraged to go to New York because that's where all the publishers lived. And I had a, a, a man who gave me actually entree into the office of a literary agent, and she sent me to some of the major publishing houses in Manhattan. And I thought, oh boy, there's going to be a bidding war for a cup of Christmas tea. Yay! I'm going to be rich. And so I go to all of these publishers, and they all tell me the same thing. No. And the reasons were threefold. Number one, this is a Christmas book. It's got limited shelf life. Number two, it's written in this sing-song verse that went out with the curtsy in the last century. Number three, who is Tom Haig? No marquee value in this name, so three strikes and you're out. So I did the only thing that any decent self-respecting artist would do. I went to my folks and begged for money. And my mom and dad, Jimmy and Jeanette Haig, who had a little restaurant in downtown Minneapolis and were really living from hand to mouth, uh, gave me, because they had no guarantee they'd ever give a dime of it back, some $10,000 that I might self-publish the first run of a cup of Christmas tea, 5,000 books, on a vanity press. That's when I approached Warren. And once we had the book in hand, we were able to sell the story to a local publisher who uh, went under after a couple of years of putting the book out. And then comes the most important turn in the history of this story. It came across the desk of a man named Ned Waldman. Now, Ned Waldman uh, saw immediately a woman who was very important in his own life in the story, Adele Molitor. And he read the story, and he knew that it was about his Adele. And he had been raised for the first years of his life by Adele after his mom uh, died very shortly after he was born, and he was left in Adele's care. And for the first five years of his life, Adele was the only mommy that he knew before his extended family uh, raised him. And they saw to it that Ned had 
access, ready access to Adele, and they were as close as son and mother for the whole span of her time on this planet. And when Ned saw this book, he said, in Adele's honor, if I can become the publisher of this book, I am going to make it the best-selling Christmas book in the United States of America. And that is a promise that he has kept many times over, along with his son, Brett. And uh, we have moved nearly, I guess we're coming up fairly close on two million copies, five consecutive years on the New York Times bestseller list, which I believe is an accomplishment unprecedented for a local mom and pop publisher. And when I think about how close I came to saying no <laughs> uh, on that telephone call, I mean, it really is quite quite remarkable. The story of this story uh, still still astounds me, I think. An idea for a book, I think. Ah, very good. Why don't you write it? All right. And I'll see if I can find an illustrator. Excellent. Okay. Well, so then the story continues. Yes. So we go on to book number two, mm -hmm. which is up to the lake. Right. And you come up with me mm -hmm. to northern Minnesota, to the area around Big Fork, on Big Turtle Lake, and we spend a night in the cabin where I used to spend the first 17 years of my life, and we did a book called Up to the Lake. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful time. I, I got to witness Tom moving around the cabin of his childhood, touching the things that he hadn't seen in over 20 years, and reliving those memories that ended up being captured in his poems that are in the book. And I got to take lots of photographs of the, uh, the cabin and the surrounding area and turn those into the illustrations for that book. And that was a, that was a real joy and a joyful weekend no, that we spent a there. A lot of fun. And of course, at, since we've gone on to create lots of other books together, and mm -hmm. including the ones about uh, Peef, the Christmas bear. Uh, this was the first one, uh, uh, the one entitled Peef, the Christmas bear. Of course, when we did this, we never realized that there would be a second book and now a third book, and we hope there will be many, many more. Um, Tom came to me and said, I'd like to do a book for children that teaches the same lesson a, that a cup of Christmas tea does, and that is the lesson of being selfless, of giving of yourself, and uh, sacrificing something that means something to you for the benefit of someone else. And I thought it was a wonderful story idea, and we sat down and talked through that a bit. But the name of this little bear that Tom had created eluded us for a long time. And so uh, I'll let you tell this story. Well, Warren and I had a name the bear breakfast. And uh, there we sat eating our breakfast and coming mm -hmm. up with all sorts of names like Poppy and Fweepy and who knows what all we suggested. And none of them rang true. And uh, so we gave up and we were walking back to the car and I said suddenly, Peef. And Warren said, excuse me? And I said, Peef, could that be the name of the bear? And then Warren said, Peef, Peef. And then he said, it sounds soft, it sounds plush, and I don't think that a kid can say it without smiling. So my brother, Jimmy, to whom I put my dedication of the book when I was very little, had a number of stuffed toys. And some of them had squeakers in the tummy, and he used to say, here, Tommy, make the bear go peef, because he decided that in English transliteration, that <laughs> sound was P-E-E-F. So peef he was christened, and peef he remained. And he's been a great friend to us, and now we have the third book called uh, Peef and His Best Friend, and to have that little guy sitting on my drawing table one more time and doing the illustrations for that book has just been a, another joy. Then you go and make history. Now, oh, Warren, shucks. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Warren is not only an illustrator, he is also a writer in his own right and a magnificent one. And he has created a number of books, but there's one in particular that we want to focus on because it has genuinely made national history. The events of the past uh, uh, months, particularly what happened in the country on September 11th, was a cataract in the nation. And as we have gathered our forces together uh, to uh, do some healing, there is an organization that is called the Next Place Network that has gotten together in order to give copies of Warren's book, The Next Place, to families who have survived people who were lost in the tragedies of September 11th. And we want uh, Warren to tell you about this magnificent book. Well, it's, it's a book that um, 
I wrote without really knowing what its, what its life would be like. It's much like having children when uh, you give them all the care and love that you can while they're in your hands, but then they go on to have a life of their own, and all you can do is stand back and watch as a parent. And I, uh, I feel very much like the parent of this book, and it's having a marvelous life on its own as it gives healing and peace to people who have lost loved ones through death. Uh, I'd like to read this for you, if I may. This is called The Next Place. The next place that I go will be as peaceful and familiar as a sleepy summer Sunday and a sweet, untroubled mind. And yet, it won't be anything like any place I've ever been or seen or even dreamed of in the place I leave behind. I won't know where I'm going, and I won't know where I've been as I tumble through the always and look back toward the when. I'll glide beyond the rainbows. I'll drift above the sky. I'll fly into the wonder without ever wondering why. I won't remember getting there. Somehow I'll just arrive, but I'll know that I belong there and will feel much more alive than I have ever felt before. I will be absolutely free of the things that I held on to that were holding on to me. The next place that I go will be so quiet and so still that the whispered song of sweet belonging will rise up to fill the listening sky with joyful silence and with unheard harmonies of music made by no one playing like a hush upon a breeze. There will be no room for darkness in that place of living light where an ever-dawning morning pushes back the dying night. The very air will fill with brilliance as the brightly shining sun and the moon and half a million stars are married into one. The next place that I go won't really be a place at all. There won't be any seasons, winter, summer, spring, or fall, nor a Monday, nor a Friday, nor December, nor July, and the seconds will be standing still while hours hurry by. I will not be a boy or a girl, a woman or a man. I'll simply be just simply me, no worse or better than. My skin will not be dark or light. I won't be fat or tall. The body I once lived in won't be part of me at all. I will finally be perfect. I will be without a flaw. I will never make one more mistake or break the smallest law. And the me that was impatient or was angry or unkind will simply be a memory, the me I left behind. I will travel empty-handed. There is not a single thing I have collected in my life that I would ever want to bring, except the love of those who loved me and the warmth of those who cared, the happiness and memories and magic that we shared. Though I will know the joy of solitude, I'll never be alone. I'll be embraced by all the family and friends I've ever known. Although I might not see their faces, all our hearts will beat as one, and the circle of our spirits will shine brighter than the sun. I will cherish all the friendship I was fortunate to find, all the love and all the laughter in the place I leave behind. All these good things will go with me. They will make my spirit glow, and that light will shine forever in the next place that I go. It's yeah. incredible. It's been, it's been remarkable what's happened with this book um, since it came out. Uh, just uh, about three weeks ago, I was in River Falls, Wisconsin and uh, did a program there for some senior citizens. And afterwards, the woman who had uh, invited me there asked if I had a few minutes, could she take me somewhere and show me something? 
And so we got in the car, and it, as we drove, she was telling me the story of a young girl in River Falls, Wisconsin, who had a debilitating uh, disease since childhood, early childhood. And what I realized is that we were going to the cemetery. This young girl had died last year at age 18. And we came to her grave, and there's a black granite uh, tombstone there in the shape of a teardrop. And engraved upon that tombstone is a quote from this book. Now, I can't say that without getting chills. And, uh, and I never would have dreamed that I had created anything that would have that meaning and that permanence. But I think we've done that together over the years, you and I. Yeah, it's uh, a very, very blessed thing to be able to have a, a, a collaborative family where everybody is, uh, is on the same page, so to All speak. Right. Back in the old days of uh, publishing, if you read some of the histories, you'll see that there used to be publishing houses, particularly in New York, uh, that nurtured authors. That really doesn't happen anymore in a lot of those big houses. But we have the blessings uh, at, at Waldman House Press of having a family where absolutely everybody uh, has got an idea in mind, and that is that all of the work that we produce tries to appeal to the better angels of our natures, and that inside every human being is a longing for reconciliation, for harmony, and peace. And uh, that's our mission. And what a joyful one to be on together after 20 years. That's right. And I look forward to 20 more. Amen. All right. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers, is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. Mm -hmm.